So the way that I like to think about it is, uh, frankly, when I was asked to talk here, um, the goal was actually very simple, to share a little bit of my own journey and uh, maybe tell a story about what's interesting, what's uh, possibly exciting for chip design. So I thought maybe I'll just talk spontaneously, but, but then I'll go off track. So I'll just write three slides. How about that? So I, I decided I'll just probably tell a story of three journeys, right? A journey about the past, a journey about the present, and a journey into the future. And uh, let me get started. So the first journey is a journey of the past, which is a personal journey of learning. So it, it it's basically an introduction of myself. And I want to share a few lessons. So like you heard just now that I, I have uh, essentially grown up as a circuit designer. I, I graduated from UIUSC. I worked on digital circuit at Intel and Samsung, so 2D circuits. And then I did a startup uh, with active interposers and triplets. So that's uh, two and a half D. A synopsis I'm working on 3D IC. So I sometimes I'll just joke that I, it took me about 15 years to uh, add one dimension to my circuit designer resume line item, <laughs> only one D. Um, so as I look back, right, this is a, really a journey of learning. I, I would just probably highlight uh, three interesting moments of my, I guess, professional life, right? The first moment is when I got my first job after graduation uh, out of PhD in 2006, right? It's really good because finally you're actually getting paid for drawing uh, diagrams and uh, printing out circuits, right? Real money, right? That's really good. So the one interesting thing that happened to me was when I took the first job, I realized whatever I studied on the PhD is actually not a good fit for my job. And, and it's actually not a technical reason because my PhD topic was red heart circuit design and modeling. At that point, I was a uh, Chinese citizen without a green card. Guess what? The people who would offer me a job are NASA or uh, Department of Defense or uh, supercomputing. So I can't really work on that. So my first job ended up being DFT, which has nothing to do with my PhD. I guess I turned out okay. <laughs> That's the first lesson I learned. First job has nothing to do with PhD by accident. The uh, second uh, interesting moment was um, after I worked on a number of chips, server chips, mobile chips, I uh, decided I'm gonna get seduced to join a FinTech software company. I was doing some software work, machine learning, to try to predict the direction of stock market. And uh, I failed terribly. And uh, it's very hard to predict the direction of the stock market and uh, especially the future. So I think the lessons I learned was really that uh, I, I'm really, I really enjoy more creating chips, right? Or physical things as opposed to uh, pure software, right? So the second lesson I learned is to figure out what I actually didn't like. So the third interesting moment was I did a startup of my own. And uh, right before 2014, I was a super introvert and very R&D focused person. And turns out as it is structured, I had to be the CEO for this company because I was the slightly less nerdy of the co-founder group. That was kind of an interesting, turbulent ride. And uh, I think I learned to work with people. I learned to uh, make presentations. I learned to create business plans. I learned to, uh, I guess, uh, try to sell, um, which is a very important skill. So these are the three lessons I learned on my journey of learning that I love to share with you. It's not a linear journey. Life is interesting, right? Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, but it's all about a journey. Now, I wanted to talk about the journey of the present. Now, how many people actually know what this is? You probably don't have to answer me. I'm assuming that the system is not set up in such a way you can answer my question. I'm guessing many of you don't know what this is. Uh, this is actually a machine called BB Call. It's a machine that you put on your belt, you will receive an incoming alert if somebody tries to reach you. 
it's a inbound only communication device I actually owned in 1999. <laughs> and then uh, after coming to US, this is my first cell phone, right? It's, it's a pretty simple cell phone that works pretty well, this bi-directional communication device. And then 2007, I had my first iPhone. That was great, right? Very elegant product. Well, you know, it, it can only take pictures. It cannot really capture live videos. And YouTube on an iPhone, as you probably couldn't imagine at that point, was not really a possibility. <laughs> so you have to uh, go through a very complex mechanism to watch YouTube videos on iPhone 1, 2007. Now, the reason why I'm sharing these pictures that's part of my journey is because I really think that something really exciting is happening right now on this journey of technology evolution, right? 2007, we barely had a phone with a nice touch screen, right? And it doesn't even capture video. Well, look at it, what's happening now. They're connected smart things. They're connected wearables, right? They're, they're cars that drive themselves. There are uh, all kinds of uh, crazy technologies that, that it's very hard to imagine back in 2007, right? And Bitcoins and medical science improvement, uh, brain computer interface, right? supercomputers and smart cities, connected bicycles, right? It's kind of crazy, right? So I would really think that the past 15 years, right? Starting about 2006, 2007 until today, it's really exciting that technology has evolved greatly. And as a result, many interesting hardware products have uh, been invented and volume produced and deployed. Now, the reason why I think this is interesting and relevant is really twofold, right? Well, one is that, like I said, life is kind of interesting, right? As you're traveling on the road, you don't really kind of feel it, right? But when you look back, it's really interesting. Like I said, the pictures I showed back in 2007, iPhone one, and before that, that flip phone, right? It, it took only about 15 years to get to where we are today. Imagine, imagine, give it another 10 years to 15 years. What's it gonna be? What are gonna be the pictures on this same slide? If one of you is going to make this presentation to your fellow DAC students in 10 to 15 years, what are the 12 pictures you're gonna choose? I think you should think about it. You may be able to create some of these things yourself. You may be able to inspire some of these things yourself. And you may be able to create some products and fail, but that doesn't matter. It's really the potential of continuous technology evolution that really excites me. Now, that's the journey of technology evolution. How about what I call the journey of creation? Right? I, I'm a dreamer myself. I, I, I dream of things. I, I like to create products. I like to create products that are useful, that provide a delightful user experience. And I'm a hardware fan. I'm a chip fan, right? Definitely. So what is the journey of creating a wonderful product? In my view, it really starts with exploration. Whatever hardware product you're building, whatever chip you're building, you need to explore thoroughly your options. Right. You need to choose from the menu of options. Right? What are the design, architecture, choices, and how are you going to make it? And how much does it cost? And how soon you're going to get it? You want to play a little bit in the sandbox before you actually build it. The second step is to actually design it, meaning going from a crazy idea, a napkin sketch, to a manufacturer-ready design from A to Z. Now you kind of want to do it quickly. And then finally, go make it. Make it reliably and robustly because you want to provide great products that carry and provide delightful user experience to the users of the world, right? So I would just say that journey of creation really manifests itself in three steps. Explore thoroughly your options, design your dream rapidly, and manufacture your product robustly. As someone very famous has said, creativity is just connecting things or connecting dots. 
And that's what I believe really Journey of Creation is all about. It's really about connecting the knowledge you have learned until today, right? Whether it's computer science, algorithms, circuit design, system design, or something else, right? That's your knowledge level. And also about connecting dots in terms of building blocks, right? IPs, models, software, manufacturing substrates. And all of these things get connected. You permutate, you shuffle your card, you create a wonderful product that's gonna change the world. So this is my view of uh, sort of uh, the journeys, right? This is really the tale of uh, three journeys, right? The first journey is about how I learned so far, personal journey. The second journey is what I believe is going to be very exciting in the next 10, 15 years, given what happened in the past 10, 15 years for technology evolution. And finally, journey of creation. I, I think a lot of you guys are creators of chips and creators of systems. And I want you to know that there's a lot of opportunity to create your own thing. Now, I'd like to take some questions and have a live discussion. But uh, before that, let me just kind of go from this very high level description of the journeys to something very specific. You know, a lot of you are PhD students. You're going to get really bored listening to presentations on timing closure, power integrity, signal integrity, all that stuff. I, I, I'll try not to get into that. Let me see if I can talk about a particular case study with just a couple of slides. The goal is not to explain it very well. The goal is to really see if it opens up doors for you. What about what about what I call system of chips as an example of the next wave of innovation opportunities. As you all know, SOC used to be really referring to system on a chip, as in a single chip. System of chips is what I call um, what I guess industry sometimes refer to as 3DIC chiplets, advanced packaging. It's a mechanism to combine various ingredients coming from different process nodes from different vendors into a complete chip stack that gives you better performance, better power, and likely a lower amount of volume or area. So it's better PPA. Now, fundamentally, it's made up of three things or three types of things. One, components, right? Lego blocks, chiplets or chips. You could have a chiplet that is a AI accelerator. You could have a chiplet or a chip that is a sensor, and you could have a chip that is a large piece of memory, whether it's SRAM or DRAM. And then you have to have a way to connect them, interconnect the second piece. Interconnects could go through interposers or substrates. And then finally, you have the whole thing, which is the system, i.e. the system of chips. Now, to put all of that, what I just said, in practice, this is what EDA, and chip design community is actually doing to make this a reality, to really create system of chips, to really provide a total solution, you need to enable three things. Number one are the interface IPs that connect all the dice or chiplets together and the early modeling framework attached to the IPs. Number two is the design platform or the design tools that perform the task of architecture planning implementation, verification, simulation, analysis, sign off for design. And then finally, when you create the chips in manufacturing steps, a lot of the techniques such as design for test, design for debug, lifecycle management come into play. So this is how EDA or chip design community can enable the next wave of system of chips by giving designers wings, right? the wings being the interface IP that connects the dice, the design platform that automates the design practice and the various DFX and SLM technology that, that enable and empower the manufacturing deployment. So with that, thank you.